you want to turn your brain off and watch dumb television, watch Emily in Paris on Netflix. The acting is straight up terrible. Like, they're not even trying to be good actors. I agree that it's not, like, great TV writing or plot or anything, but it's nice to see a different city and people in a completely pretend, like, world with, like, a glossy sheen to it. You know what I mean? Right, like, no one's wearing masks. (laughs) Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. We are two weeks out from Election Day, and starting today, we're going to be doing daily podcasts through the end of the campaign. So the final stretch is officially upon us. Today, we're going to ask a question that's been on people's minds. Is the outcome of this election more certain than it was at a similar point in 2016? As we sit down to tape, Biden is leading by about 11 points nationally. He's leading by closer to seven points in the likeliest tipping point states, and he has an 88% chance of winning the election, according to the 538 forecast. Also today, we're going to discuss what full Democratic control of federal government could look like should the party win the presidency, the House, and Senate this fall. In particular, which divisions might become important and which part of the party is likely to be dominant. And here with me to do all of that are Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Good day, Galen. Good day. Also here with us is Senior Politics Writer Claire Malone. Hey, Claire. Hey, Galen. And also here with us is Senior Politics Writer Perry Bacon Jr. Hey, Perry. Hi, Galen. So, uh, happy Monday, two weeks till Election Day. How is everyone feeling? Um, Ordinarily, I'd be looking forward to some vacation post election given that i think we're not allowed to americans go to any other countries um you can go to mexico and even within the u.s travel's a bit dubious i don't have that to look forward to but you know you know uh yeah another day in paradise but no if you think that like if you think that oh my god you know these nate loves the election, right? It's his Super Bowl. No, I hate it. <laughs> um, how does everyone else feel? Is that everyone else's take? Or uh, is anyone excited for the next two weeks? I'm not excited for the next two weeks only because we're going to have a lot of the sort of like poll X says Y, let's all analyze it. Like, you know, we have to say just average the polls. And I find that dialogue to be the, did you miss this poll? So-and-so has, that, that kind of stuff is kind of exhausting to me because nobody after the election says, sorry, you guys were right. We obsessed about silly stuff and you, no one's going to come back and say that. So we have to do a lot of sort of debunking silly stuff in my view. Yeah. Claire? You just want a repetitious answer. I mean, like, uh, you know, it's a monotonous election because it's all it's all new, but it's all the same. And we've had four years of sort of learning the behaviors of Trump and like learning the behaviors of how people react to news in a partisan way. So it's kind of like soul sucking from from that side of things. And as Nate points out, not much to look forward to. So take your cyanide this morning, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and in a way, like we have, like not 538 as a whole having less to say about the election, right? But like, this is not an election where like the model is going to tell you anything that interesting, right? Biden is way ahead in the polls. Um, and yet there is some chance, not particularly high, but some non trivial chance that Trump could win, right? Um, and like, if you were betting on the outcome, wagering on it, then whether Trump's chances are say 5% or 25% are pretty relevant, right? Um, That's a big spread. But, you know, as like a practical participant in the outcome, I'm not sure that's necessarily a a terribly useful distinction, right? You know, you're going to say, oh, well, um, I was going to vote this way, but now I'll skip it because it's only a 5% chance instead of 12% of this very consequential thing happening, right? Like, that doesn't really seem that prudent we're all kind of taking all these very careful chances around coronavirus which if you're under 70 has like a you know 0.5 or 1 percent chance or something of being fatal um some chance of complications but like but there's like not that much to to say from like a poll analysis standpoint you know all right so given everything 
you all just said. Let's talk about how this election is or isn't different from 2016 and what that tells us about how durable Biden's lead is. And I'll just say, I know that this can be a sensitive subject and that when thinking about elections, of course, it's important to rely on examples beyond just the most recent election. But this is something our listeners have been pretty curious about. And also, it's the subtext of a lot of the coverage we're seeing this cycle. So let's try to address the question as thoughtfully as we can. So to start out, 15 days before Election Day in 2016, which is where we are now in this cycle, Hillary Clinton had an 86% chance of winning the election, and she had about a seven-point lead nationally. So is there any reason to believe that this election is more over at this point than that one was 15 days out? You know, the probabilities are pretty similar. Yeah, a 14% chance is a 14% chance or 12% in Trump's case. I mean, look, obviously we talked about doing this segment, um... And part of the reason I want to do this segment, Galen, is because I'm going to give you like a little bit of pushback, like you're kind of teasing in the intro, right? Um, I think the whole point of a site like 538 to encourage more rigorousness, more empiricism, is precisely to get you out of making a comparison based on a sample size of one. We have a small sample size period of presidential elections, but our model is based on... um, Basically, all polling in elections since 1936, there's obviously a lot more detail in polling and races from 1972 or so onward. Um, So we try to use all that data the best we can. Um, But so you had two things in 2016, right? You had a shift in the final 10, 12 days because of the Comey letter, other factors, about three points toward Trump. And then you had a polling error, which averaged two or three points in the key swing states. Um, So for Biden, let's use Pennsylvania here as a stand-in because it's currently the tipping point state in our model, right? Biden is up 6.7 points in Pennsylvania as of, we're taping this. If you have a three-point swing toward Trump, like in 2016, then he's up by three points. Then you have a three-point polling error. Okay, then it's a toss-up, right? Biden's ahead by 0.7 points, and now we're kind of, um, you know, fighting over uh, these naked ballots in Pennsylvania. Maybe it's going to litigation, whatever else, right? Um, So sure, you know, if things shift in Trump's direction um, and there's a polling error, then Trump could win. But the question is, what is the likelihood of that? And the answer is about 12%, right? That's where kind of the number comes from. Um, I would also say it's like not totally apples to apples to to 2016. Um, Biden has a considerably larger lead in national polls than Clinton did. In the tipping point states, it's a bit more similar. Um, And that's basically what our model uses to forecast probabilities. Now, I'd also point out Um, There are a few other differences. Um, Number one, we are talking about like a high watermark for Clinton at about this time in the race, kind of after the Access Hollywood tape, right? Um, So when you're kind of comparing someone's high watermark to the current state of affairs, you're kind of implicitly assuming it's a high watermark when it might not be. It's, I think, a little bit dubious. Um, Number two, there are fewer undecideds this year. So Biden's already at 52 or 50, 53% in national polls. He's generally around 51% in Pennsylvania and other swing states. So um, so Trump can't win merely by getting the undecideds to, to flock toward him as he did in 2016. He would need to have um, actual changes of opinion at this point. Um, but number three, which number are we on? Um, I think there is additional uncertainty related to male voting. Um, our model assumes that um, because a lot of people are voting for the first time, that can make turnout harder to predict. It was harder to predict in the primaries when you switched over to mail voting. And that adds additional uncertainty in in both directions. So, you know, I mean, if you're comparing, Clinton was in a good position at this point in 2016. We think the type of candidate who um, who was in that position is going to win, you know, whatever it was, 85%, 86% of the time, right? Um the fact that her die came up on the one in seven and the 14% doesn't particularly have bearing on whether Biden's would. It's a pretty different race. Um, and also he's in a, at least a marginally stronger position. Yeah. Um, I wanted those to Perry and Claire, just in terms of thinking about the ways that this election is different from the kinds of stories that we've been covering or how stable the polls have been and why they've been so stable. How do you try to describe this? Uh, from, you know, covering this in the press. 
I think the biggest difference is the pandemic and the prevalence of mail-in voting and the increased rhetoric surrounding the validity of ballots and the sort of, you know, open talk that there will be a lot of litigation following Election Day. I think in, you know, in past elections, there hasn't been that sort of, you know, oh, we're all going to get to know the recount lawyers really well kind of foreshadowing. And that is very much the tenor of this election. I mean, people have been voting now for quite a while. You know, there's been, what, 30 million ballots cast so far in the 2020 election. Um, Ballots will be counted and be received um, in the week following election in some places, um, following election day in some places. So I think that's the biggest difference in all this is that we're almost having two conversations. One of the conversations is the sort of quote unquote normal one around the model in our case or in our kind of journalism. And then there's sort of the separate um, known unknowns of the um, days and weeks following election day where we say, well, you know, if let's say Biden is the winner, but he doesn't win by, you know, TK points, then we won't know Uh, you know, we won't have a great amount of certainty in certain places. So I do think that there's like very separate conversations that are happening that sort of get intertwined, but are actually different things. And that's the nature of this election is that we have to kind of um, balance the the normal kind of model stuff and then the 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 novelty of the the pandemic and mail in election. So part of the challenge in discussing this is like my neighbor asked me a couple of days ago, like, who's going to win the election? Is, 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 is Biden definitely going to win? And I said to him, I have all the same information you have, like, as I know he reads the site and reads the same data thing. So I think part of the thing is if the people who think that Trump winning a second term will be the end of democracy as we know it, me saying that has a 12% chance of happening and an 88% chance of not happening is not reassuring to them or whatever because they're like a 12% chance of something happening that is like so earth shattering is still worth thinking about. So I think part of it is my sense is a lot of the questions we're getting from readers, or at least I'm getting, are more along the lines of this thing I really don't want to happen. I want you to assure me it's not going to happen and I can't because that's not how elections work and I and I think that's kind of why this is sort of a frustrating topic it's like people are really asking for a level of certainty that I think we've spent four years trying to communicate we can't give but people are not comfortable with uncertainty is my I'm not a psychologist but that's my impression having worked here for four years now that there's some there's some un- uncomfortable with uncertainty period I would say I think 26 million people have voted already. So, again, this is not my expertise, but it does seem to me that you, if you're Joe Biden, you'd like to, the situation in which you're banking in a lot of votes early on is different than 2016. My guess is the people who are voting early are more likely to have decided. And if there's an undecided swing to Trump, that's outside of this 26 million. But if we're talking about 50 million people maybe voting before November 3rd in an environment in which Biden is ahead by 10 points, I'm not the math expert here, but it seems to me that would be good for Biden and maybe better than for Clinton because there wasn't so much early voting. Yeah, I think I looked at a comparison to 2016 and so far at a similar point in 2016 for comparison, six times as many people have voted in 2020. Yeah, look, I mean, um, if you're looking for some type of existential certainty that Joe Biden will win the election, then, I mean, this is not the place you're going to find that. (laughs) Maybe, right? Um, (laughs) You know, look, even if our model gets to, I mean, if Biden holds this lead where it expands, then... I mean, I'll get in the 90s, you know, maybe mid to high 90s. But again, um, you know, if you have an event that is as important as I think both Biden and Trump supporters would say the election is, then even a 2% chance is something worth considering. Um, With that said, like what Perry said, if I were looking to um, have reasons to worry a little bit less as a Biden voter, then certainly the very large number of mail and early votes so far, which because you can track party registration of people who voted is very democratic, right? Um, it doesn't mean that Trump can't come back because the polls show this happening, 
they expect there to be this big Democratic vote in the early vote. Um, and then for Republicans to make up for that, at least partly with an election day vote. But it does show that the polls are right about that first part, at least, right? It does show this large early Democratic turnout is occurring. Um, and so if one of the ways that Trump realizes his 12% chance is by Democratic turnout being depressed, that looks a bit less likely now. Um, so in an in effed up way, kind of Trump people now should be hoping that the polls are right, that there will be this big Trump surge on election day, right? Because in a world where we weren't looking at polls um, and we weren't allowed to look at polls, right? We look at these numbers and be like, oh my God, Democrats are ahead by 30 points in return ballots so far, right? This is going to be, you know, the most epic landslide since McGovern, right? And that's not what the polls show. The polls show that Biden's pretty far ahead, um, but not McGovern versus Nixon territory and that it should tighten some with all these election day votes. So I think we get two kinds of questions, to be fair to our listeners. One is very much like, can you give me a level of certainty, which is simply not possible in these kinds of events? And the other type of question is, all right, I'm looking at all of this data. I'm seeing that there are fewer undecideds. Biden is already at 50% nationally or above you know, nationally and in some of the likely tipping point states as well. We're seeing that this has been a steadier election in the polls in general. We're not seeing that kind of, you know, up and down roller coaster that we saw in 2016. So why are their probabilities still so similar when some of the fundamental numbers that we're looking at are quite different? Well, again, look, I want to push back a little bit on the notion that like um, the probabilities are similar because like, Clinton peaked at being an 86% favorite, right? Um, but for m- most of the election, she was not as heavy a favorite as Biden is at a comparable point in time, right? And the minute that, like, the Comey letter kicks in, whichever equivalent day that was, and she'll go to being much less of a favorite than than Biden is. Um, so, yeah, Clinton at her high water mark again, looked pretty good um, post-Access Hollywood, right? Um, I would also mention that 2016, we didn't see, our model did detect that the state polls were better for Trump than the national polls, but it was not as big a spread as we're seeing right now. Um, but I don't know. I just don't, I don't know what readers are, are looking for. And by the way, just because Biden now clears some threshold where he could survive a 2016 style polling error, there can be a bigger polling error. There was in 1948, for example, that doesn't make him safe. Right? So basically like the less you think about 2016, the more I think, sane you're actually going to be right there is a certain amount of there's a certain amount of like tweakiness among our our readers and and people who write in the questions and i get it like i get why people are because we live in this like very like you know micro news cycle age and so people who are kind of attuned to i hate to put it this way but i think it's a little bit this thing this sort of like the, they're attuned to the the little ups and downs and sort of it's a bit of a gamification of like, ooh, the last two weeks of the election, let me hold on for this roller coaster. But like if you pull back and if you sit down in like the armchair and think about it, um, you're basically just like asking the model and if you write to us, like asking us to kind of like soothe your anxiety for two weeks or to like give you a certain amount of like calming calamine for your brain but, you know, you just kind of have to, like, sit with the discomfort, right, to use therapy talk, that, like, this is just a thing that you need to wait for and that it is uncertain. But the, there has become this kind of, like, um, desire to fill the little peaks and valleys that I do find, like, and maybe it's because I've been, you know, I've been here for five years. I'm sort of like, I don't know, just, just wait. That's all you got to do. Just wait two weeks. Plus also, <laughs> what's another thing they tell you, like, uh, to face your fears, essentially? So, like, if you are a Trump supporter fearing that Biden will win or a Biden supporter fearing that Trump will win, you should just imagine what life will be like in either of those. You know, if you're a Biden scenario, it's maybe only 12 percent. But, like, get comfortable with that 12 percent. What does what does that mean to you? Like, uh what do they say? Like, if you're afraid of losing your hair, you should just shave your head and then live with the reality of what it's like to not have hair. Just face, but face I do your th- fears, man. But I do think, you know, to, to imagine the conversations that are happening 
you know, behind those reader letters or tweets or, or people's, you know, anxiousness about this. I think a lot of it is that is like if you're a Trump supporter, you're imagining what it would be like if Biden were, were elected. And if you're a Biden supporter, you're imagining what it's like if Trump is elected again. And there is a certain amount of like you have to you, like you're coming to the end of it. This is the terminus. How is it going to end for you? And like, what is the other side going to be like? And I think people are confronting that emotional chasm. And I'm sorry to put it like that, but like, I think it's, you know, like we all have family and friends that we talk about this stuff with. And there is a great deal of like, um, just like pure human anxiety. Like, what? Yeah. After this dragons, right? Like what's on the other side. And I think that that's like a very real thing for everyone in America right now. The other thing is people are asking us a lot of questions about, I get a lot of emails being like, I read this story in the New York Times about Pennsylvania voting registration for Republicans is up. So people are looking for what are we missing in the polls, right? And, and we're trying to do all that, of course. Like we've written about Jeff Skelly and Nathaniel Rickage, our colleagues have written about shy Trump voters. They wrote about how the pollsters are adjusting for education, which they didn't do as much in 2016. So I think part of the issue is like we're addressing a lot of the problems maybe of 2016. The issue is like there may be new issues that come up. Like I don't know that... I don't know that the FBI is investigating Joe Biden. I, get, I mean, so but they weren't. So that kind of thing came with 16, but I don't think that's happening. Maybe there's a different issue that makes the polls narrow in the last two weeks. Maybe there's a different kind of polling error with Latinos in several states or with black voters. I just, I think part of it is like, um, there is a potential for polling error based on factors we've not currently seen that we don't expect. But again, the whole point of like unexpected polling error is that it is unexpected. So I think this is a really challenging time. That point, Perry, as obvious as it might be, I think is worth repeating, right? The whole notion of like, sometimes I'll be like on some radio show or whatever, people be like, uh, so what surprises do you expect? It's like, well, that's a little bit of an oxymoron, <laughs> right? Um, and the whole reason why polling error isn't very consistent from year to year, sometimes it favors Democrats, sometimes Republicans, sometimes you go a couple of years in a row where it favors one party, then it flips or whatever else, right? Is because if pollsters knew their polls were biased in a certain direction, then they would try to correct for that, right? They might undercorrect or overcorrect, but like they're not usually going to... Um, publish numbers that they believe to be wrong. And so, you know, we're very into the notion that like, um, that there's more error in polls than some people assume, right? I think the analytical mistake people make is assuming that like the error will necessarily favor Trump, right? It's easy to imagine a few things happen where like, okay, pollsters are being cautious and hurting a little bit. They don't want to like show these gargantuan Biden leads, right? So they choose the version of their likely voter model in Wisconsin that has them up only eight to not 12 or something, right? Um, then you have these like online and robo polls, some of which probably are, are overly weighted toward a certain presumption about the electorate that couldn't account for higher Democratic turnout. And then maybe Trump's voters are depressed on election day and there's a pandemic spreading and they don't turn out as much. And I don't know. It's not hard to imagine a set of scenarios where Biden wins by like 12 or 13 points, right? Just it's not hard to imagine a scenario where Trump draws the race quite a bit closer, but like it's it's bi-directional. Yeah, I mean, so not to do what you just said that people ask you to do in radio shows, but in addition to what you just laid out, like reasons to expect that there could just as likely be a polling error that favors Biden as there is a polling error that favors Trump. Are there other things that you all are watching in terms of not things that you're like, oh, you know, what what surprises are, do you expect, but things that you're curious about? Like when you look at the data, when you look at polls, when you look at trends nationally or certain how certain demographics are voting or have swung since 2016, are there certain things that you're curious about? So one thing I'm curious about is like, Nate was hitting at this a little bit earlier, but um, the sort of, I guess, hurting is the term is like, so Georgia, there was a poll in Georgia from, I think, Quinnipiac that showed Biden ahead so sort of with a clear lead, the Senate candidates who are Democrats doing pretty well. When I see a poll like that, the question I have mostly is like, I, I think a lot of the pollsters have some incentives to maybe not have polls that seem weird. And in, in my sense is probably the, the incentive they most have is to not seem have polls that make them seem too pro-Democrat. So 
that's kind of the one thing is like, so are we with the Georgia and Texas polls, particularly, I'm almost sort of like curious, do we have any sense of what Georgia is going to be like? Because we have, a, I know the pollsters are very wary of being, if you have a poll that shows Texas, you know, Biden by six and Trump wins Texas, that'll be worse than if you had the, the reverse of that, I think, in a certain way. So that's one thing I'm looking for. Uh, the second thing is like, obviously, like, I don't know exactly how the vote counting processes are going to work in some of these states. I don't know exactly if the polls are having a, if like a certain number of absentee ballots get the rules get they get thrown out for some reason. We have all these lawsuits happening about the counting process. So that is kind of the thing. That, and, and I'm having a, I'll be honest with you, I'm having trouble following because basically every swing state has a different process for how absentee ballots are counted, yeah. when yeah. they're counted, wh- you know, if there's still litigation, how the litigation is going, which judges are, you know, in charge of it, if they're in federal or state court, like that stuff is really hard to follow. And if we end up being in a really close election, then I think in some ways the polls become sort of less important because if we're talking about a two point, you know, if we're talking about one to two points in a lot of these states, then that stuff matters. If we're talking about four to five, five it doesn't as much so that's kind of why i find this often i get people email me questions saying well this judge did x in north carolina how does it affect the polls and then we're in a zone where i really can't answer the question at all i would agree with that where it's like the the um I think I kind of said this before, where there are the two parts that we're sort of dealing with in our brains. And I'm perfectly comfortable with the model part. Like, what does the model say? I'm perfectly fine with assuming that polling is doing pretty well. But the other part that Perry is talking about, and here's a little plug, um, we have an ongoing live blog at 538 that's basically kind of keeping track of all this election administration stuff. We launched it last week. It'll be running through election day and beyond as, as all of this stuff unfolds. But there is a true, I mean, I think, you know, if go back and and listen to your, you know, your slow burn for the 2000 election, go back and read up on on what happened there, you know, hanging chads. Um, That's the kind of stuff that I do have this sort of like, you know, my homework in the next couple of the weeks of the campaign is to just do a lot of reading about like the judicial stuff that's happening. But like potentially there's a lot of like uh, we're all have to become legal voting experts in the like 10 days after the election which is a bit of a um a daunting prospect if i'm being honest yeah and i should mention that as we're doing these daily podcasts on wednesday of this week we're gonna have uh nathaniel rakich and amelia thompson devoe on to kind of explain the state of all of that litigation and the different rules in the different states and kind of do an overview of the state of voting as we get down to the wire so something to look forward to But let's move on and talk about our second segment today. According to our forecast, there's about a 70% chance that Democrats take full control of Washington this fall, winning the presidency, House, and Senate. It is certainly not a foregone conclusion, but today we're going to talk about what that might look like were it to happen. Democrats have not had full control of government since the first two years of the Obama administration, so think back to 2010, and the party has changed significantly since then. Perhaps most noticeably is the vocal and growing progressive wing of the party. So where does the party agree and disagree, and who would win those arguments were they to happen in a democratically controlled government? So let's start out with a very broad question, and then we can get into some of these dividing lines. Were Democrats to run the tables, control the whole thing, what are their biggest priorities likely to be? Claire, kick us off. Well, I think probably practically um, you'll try to see them do something with a, another big stimulus bill um, for for COVID relief. And potentially you could see some uh, Democratic policy ideas or like, you know, fixations of the left get in there. So, you know, um, subsidies for green businesses, you know, Green New Deal type stuff. Um, So I think that's kind of like an immediate um, legislative priority, probably. I think um, potentially depending on the the environment or the margin of victory, um, there there will be some um, appetite for things to change structures. So uh, maybe making D.C. a state, D.C. statehood could be on the table. 
Um, you've seen some new groups forming, uh, not that new anymore, but s- some some relatively new groups um, forming, pushing for judicial reform, so expanding the number of you know justices on the Supreme Court. Um, and then you've got people talking about filibuster reform. Um, so those are kind of like the the structural changes that I think are are under consideration. Um, and I think there's kind of like the immediate like pandemic relief. There's been a lot of, you know, I feel like it's been like a lower level news story, but the fighting between um, Republicans and Dem- con- congressional Republicans and Democrats over um, some of this, you know, COVID relief stuff will continue to be um, an issue if it were a divided Congress. So if Democrats take take the trifecta, <laughs> um, I think you can see them wanting to push through something much more ambitious and that is a an interesting gateway drug to talking about you know big social programs so yeah how are other people thinking about what the democratic priorities would be if they controlled government i think claire gave a good summary i might um try to put these things into three buckets right one of which is what i would call the repair and restore bucket um which would consist of COVID relief, um, which would consist of, this is trying to correct or undo for things that happened under Trump, right? COVID relief, some ways to strengthen Obamacare, including um, maybe adding a public option. And usually when parties get in power, they do something on taxes. So, you know, partly repealing um, or entirely repealing the Trump tax bill. Those are kind of in the repair category, right? And those are, I think, of the three categories of things that are most likely to happen. Um, Then there's also the structural category, which um, statehood for Puerto Rico and D.C., Supreme Court reform slash packing expansion, whatever you want to call it, Um, you know, what you're doing with the filibuster, that's category two. And then category three is what I would call kind of very ambitious – long-run democratic priorities. So climate is a big one, big social programs that would be more explicitly on the left, right? Guns. Um, you know, the way I kind of see it is like the repair stuff, you can probably get some of that with even 50 or 51 democratic senators, right? The structural stuff, um, I think you maybe need 52 or something, right? And the very ambitious stuff, I think you probably need like a true landslide with like 54 or 55. That's kind of the categories I use. Yeah, I think it's... Like- it's a lot of it has to do with like how many how the how you're looking at our Senate forecast and how it all shakes out seats wise if you assume the Democrats win. So when we think about those three different categories or whatever the Democratic priorities may be, what are the current dividing lines that would make that number of senators actually matter? Um like what kinds of people are not on board with all three of those buckets and only on board with some of them? So I tend to think on like the first bill would be some kind of economic stimulus bill that includes COVID money, some like, you know, environment, green new jobs, sort of green new deal-ish kind of stuff, but not a full-fledged that. So on that kind of bill on the economy, this a COVID bill with some green jobs in it, I assume the majority, the vast majority of Democrats in Congress will be for that. Um, I tend to think there'll be some kind of like voting. Remember they had an HR1 last year that was kind of a early voting, make voting easier bill. I tend to think that'll have most Democrats for it as well. I think there'll be some kind of racial policy like a police reforming bill. I tend to think that'll have mostly Demo- most Democrats for it as well. So when you get to the kind of controversial stuff, which I think will be If you want to add justices, you want to get rid of the filibuster. I think it's more like a left-right divide at this point between, um, I think it's like if you want to see the opponents might be, let's say, in the Senate particularly, I think the opponents would be Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema, but also like a Dianne Feinstein. I think it'll be more centrist-minded people. And I think Dianne Feinstein on abortion policy is to the left of Joe Manchin is my guess. But on sort of, there may be a Senate norms versus Senate sort of, like Sheldon Whitehouse is my guess, will be on the more liberal side of that. And then in the House, I assume you'll have the same normal divides with the sort of, um, I assume the blue dogs and members who were elected in 2018 will be more wary of big structural reforms than than the rest of the caucus, particularly the AOC types. 
who do we see winning in those kinds of standoffs potentially? Yeah, I mean the 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 numbers are. I mean, if Joe Manchin and Cinema don't vote for the bill, the bill can't pass. So I mean, in some ways, they are the Congress. Like if you you're going to have a majority of 54 people. And at the most, probably 52. So inevitably, if Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and say, I don't want this and this will hurt my political prospects for winning re-election, that's kind of where it is. Like, I thought the biggest indication of where we might be headed, though, and the surprising was like yesterday was um, Chris Coons is the senator from Delaware, close to Joe Biden. You know, Delaware is a pretty blue state, but he's kind of a moderate institutionalist, not ready for big changes. He was asked about this idea of adding judges to the Supreme Court, and he was sort of non-committal and wouldn't say no or yes. And so, so I'm so I'm curious if the math is kind of moving at, under underneath our feet. Where if you'd asked me a month ago, is Chris Coons going to be against court packing? I would have said, of course, Chris Coons will be against court packing. So, and I think Dianne Feinstein's own politics maybe are changing after she hugged Lindsey Graham and the whole Democratic Party's attacking her. So I do want, like, if you'd asked me a month ago, I'd say the institutionalist, the center will always win. But the, but the center can move left itself. And that's kind of what I think is the core question. Yeah. So I think Perry is right on, like, the caucus math. But the thing I think is pretty interesting is how much, how progressive the, like, DC think tankery campaign staffer apparatus nexus has gotten. Um, like, I think a good example of this is Brian Fallon, who used to be like, a, he was like a big Clinton guy, um, is now head of this group that's like wants to expand the number of seats on the court that wants to sort of like, you know, reform the judiciary, which I feel like is a pretty good like indicator of where the part like the the center of the establishment of the party is headed right like you can certainly be more you can certainly work for like an establishment candidate like hillary clinton or joe biden and your personal politics are much further left but i do feel like it's a good indication of the direction that the party is going particularly with younger you know as it as it goes forward over the over the decades where this just will become more and more like in the ether I wrote a piece in like December of 2018 about like, ooh, this kind of like niche idea of court packing is like kind of getting into the mainstream. And now Joe Biden won't answer (laughs) questions about it at the end of the 2020 campaign. So I think in some ways that's like an indication of how quickly this stuff can move and how much the the Trump years have been an accelerant on this and how, um, how much the idealism has sort of fallen away. I think there's a lot more people who are who are subscribing to a sort of Machiavellian, okay, well, we might only have power for two years, so we'd better go balls to the walls and like try to do stuff. Um, and I think that's a bit more of a prevailing way of thinking in the political sphere now on, on the Democratic and Republican side. So I think with court packing in particular, it's just become more salient since Ginsburg's death. And that in and of itself may have reconfigured how people are thinking about it. Beyond that kind of change, the, you know, court packing or court reform expansion, what kinds of things are going to be up for discussion under a hypothetical, you know, trifecta? Like, are we are they going to be talking about the things that were brought up during the Democratic primary campaign, like decriminalizing crossing the border or reparations or Medicare for all or, you know, there was just a whole bunch of things, you know, uh, banning assault rifles. What kinds of things? So none are going of those to things, just to be clear. So none, none of, of them. I mean, I think the, the, the Bernie Sanders, I mean, Biden won. I mean, I don't, I think the debate over whether the Bernie Sanders agenda will be passed has ended. You know, in the Bernie, so I think the question is more like, Joe Biden is very clear he's against the Green New Deal, which no one really knows what that is. So the question becomes like, the final environmental policy that Joe Biden signs 
how close to the Green New Deal is that? Is it 70%, 20%, 90%? I think the numbers might get, are getting higher, not lower. Like Medicare for all, we're not going to get Medicare for all because Joe Biden said he's not going to do that, you know, thousands of times. Like is the public option one where basically anyone can enroll in it? You know, if they work at 538, if they already have employer insurance, or is the public option a pretty limited one? Those are the kind of questions I think. Like are they going to have a reparations? No. Are they going to have a reparations commission probably not i think they might discuss that but i think are they going to change the immigration rules in the when the cross the on the border no but i so i think a lot of the sort of ideas of sanders and warren are definitely not going to happen because joe biden promised not to do them and i think in some ways but i think in some ways this is like a little bit of a game too like to me, in some ways, it's worked out well that Bernie Sanders says Joe Biden is not going as far left as I want him to. I mean, is the campaign paying him to say that? I mean, and if you're Joe Biden, ideally, Warren and AOC give a speech the 15th day of every month saying he's not left enough. He's not, you know, I think this is like a little bit of a, a I hope we don't fall into a trap of like, I think there's going to be a lot of pretend opposition at this point. Like if you're AOC, I think you put out a plan for for on every issue, you put out a plan that Joe Biden is supposed to reject. Isn't that kind of what they're doing now? In other words, the, the sort of left-right fight, I think, is going to be a little bit of a fake game where AOC's job is to have bills Biden reject. In some ways, that if she's smart, that should be her role. Well, it seems like it's not all of a campaign strategy, right? Like House progressives and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez warned Biden last week about, you know, corporate hires in putting together his administration. Like, I don't think that they're doing that because they want to make Biden look more moderate for swing voters. I think they're being earnest in that they want to have sway over how Biden conducts his administration. And they're like starting early again, conducts his hypothetical administration. Yeah, I also think I mean, certainly I think people are um They want someone who's, I think, particularly like a chief of staff for Biden, who is a friend to the progressive movement, or at least friendlier. If you're a progressive and you've lived the past decade and want to take some lessons about like how organization and staffing matters can affect, you know, what gets pushed through, you're certainly thinking about like who your friends on the transition team are and who, you know, who from the Warren campaign is on the transition team and who's going to be a friendly chief of staff for Biden if Biden is is a more small C conservative sort of guy, you know, um, the person who's been an institutionalist, as we've talked about a, a lot. So I think those staffing things do matter to people and, and do have an effect on like what gets through and what gets through to the president. Claire, you mentioned that the progressive part of the party is focusing a lot on staffing and what kind of sway they would have in a hypothetical Biden administration. Is it clear who in Biden world, if anyone, represents more of a bridge to the progressive caucus? Or is there no one like that in Biden world? And they're kind of basically trying to penetrate from outside of Biden world. So Biden had three chiefs of staff when he was vice president. There was Ron Klain, who there was Ron Klain, who the left thinks is who's more favorable to left causes than in, in, when he was in government and afterward. There was Bruce Reed, who was sort of a more centrist Democrat. And there was a Steve Reschetti, who's sort of a big name lobbyist. The left right now is pushing for Ron Klain. Their view is of the Biden people, he's most favorably they, to be to be Biden's chief of staff at the White House. So, the, for example, there's a sort of proxy fight about who's going to be chief of staff in the Biden White House. These three people are all white men, but the left has decided for whatever reason that Ron Klain is more favorable to their causes than Steve Reschetti or Bruce Reed would be. So you already have that. So what what's going on right now is there's a lot of fight o- fighting over various like treasury secretary. For example, the left wants to make sure the person who is treasury secretary is not too pro Wall Street, for example. So yeah, so I think Biden world does not have a ton of like, Elizabeth Warren level ideological people, but it has people who are sort of more centrist and maybe less centrist. And what I think is going to happen in a lot of cases is think about Kamala Harris, like Biden's first big pick was Kamala Harris. 
Kamala Harris is not like necessarily as left as Warren or Sanders, but she's not sort of anti-left either. Like she's not the way Klobuchar was in a certain way. She's not anti-left. She's also a person of color and a woman. So my guess is if you're a centrist white guy, I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit hard to get the highest level jobs in the government. Maybe I'll be proven wrong about this, but because I think there will be a look for... I think the progressives will try to fight the most centrist people. And my guess you'll end up with some kind of left center fusionish people in some jobs. And if you're a avowed centrist, my guess is you'll be a woman or a person of color. I think one interesting, one interesting question is um, how much will these structural fights placate the left from stuff like the Green New Deal, which they probably wouldn't get under a Biden administration? Um, so, for example, I'm reading a tweet now from Marcos Melitzas, who's the founder of Daily Coast, um, who's someone you would describe as like kind of more old school liberal left Democrat, not like a new school kind of Bernie person, but someone who is also not like a, you know, centrist, obviously. Um, and he says Dems must pass democracy agenda, quote unquote, first thing next year, eliminate filibuster, expand courts, D.C., Puerto Rico, and maybe Navajo nation statehood and uniform national right to vote laws, we cannot let Republicans retain minority rule. So if you have people like that who are on board with those goals, which I think are actually a little bit more plausible, maybe not Navajo Nation, but like D.C. and Puerto Rico, more voter protections to the extent the federal government can do things about that, right? Um, you know, maybe there is actually some synergy there where it's not scary to the centrist Democrats. Maybe it is some who are concerned about the electoral backlash, right? But like to center-left Democrats might not be scary like, you know, uh, like Medicare for all might be at the same time, if in the long run, if you're ever going to have Medicare for all under President AOC in 2032 or whatever, right, you're probably going to need these structural reforms to have a shot at that, right? Um, you might need to have two senators from Puerto Rico and two from D.C. So in in some sense, like it would actually be like kind of a, a smart compromise where like the kind of left gives up some near-term priorities for some long-term possibilities for things that probably weren't going to pass in the short term anyway. One thing that makes me think of is you mentioned both electoral backlash and in there you had some things like court expansion or packing, which don't have majority support. So how much of the Democratic agenda under a hypothetical Biden and trifecta essentially would be driven by policies that have majority support. Like, is this an administration that is going to follow the polls in a way that the Trump administration certainly has not? Um, or is it going to, like, basically put out media blitzes that try to change public opinion? How does how does that all work um, in, a, in a hypothetical Biden administration? It's an interesting question. Like, I think I am very curious you know, the terrible thing about like modern American politics is that you don't actually know what the candidate is thinking, given all the like exposure and, you know, the apparatus surrounding them. Like we have absolutely no idea what Joe Biden's current mindset is. At certain points in time, the idea was put out that like he's the great bridge president, right? To like, you know, to crib some David Remnick, Barack Obama rhetoric. Like he will be a bridge president. He will be a person who will soothe the country and who will like make a path and not like rock the boat too much so that potentially there will be a younger, more dynamic, new generation Democratic president who takes over in four years. I, I don't know if that's a thing that's going to happen, but I am very curious about like how Biden is thinking about um, ways to make if he's thinking about ways to get structural reforms through how he's thinking about like certain Americans um, swallowing that bitter pill. Like, I think a lot of people just off the bat don't like the idea of adding new states, don't like the idea of adding new justices to the Supreme Court. That is like a scary thing because it just is, right? Change is scary. I don't know what Biden's willingness is to kind of shove those things down people's throats. I could definitely, it's kind of like, 60 40 70 30 that he is on board on a to a certain extent because he he does seem to see himself as this um you know i don't think he's gone so far as trump did i alone can fix this but he does you know he's a guy who's run for president what three times 
So he certainly thinks of himself as like a person for the times. And, uh, and I'm very, very curious to know what Joe Biden's mindset is about all of this. It's a non-answer to your question, Galen. But I can't see into his. It was a brain. good. It was a good. It was a good answer. I didn't even realize it was a non-answer. It was so good. Like Biden, in some ways, is kind of a weather vane, which I suppose I don't mean in like the derogatory John Kerry kind of way, right? But his talent, I think, or one of his talents, is like sensing um, what the different forces pulling on him and the Democratic Party are to some extent. The juxtaposition between the Democratic Party forces and like the larger electoral incentives, right? And is like is like fairly good at reading those and is maybe not terribly ideological himself, right? Which to me would read as um, the margin of Democratic victory would matter a lot, right? If if Biden wins by 14 points and wins Texas and, and Georgia and, oh, Kansas within a point or something, right? Um, I think it's pretty different than if the race tightens and Biden's, Biden squeaks by. So it's worth breaking down the issues a little bit and thinking about, so... My sense is the COVID stimulus bill they'll start off with will have a lot of things that are popular. It'll probably raise taxes on the wealth. It'll probably create some green jobs. It'll probably encourage mass wearing. It'll incur, it'll have a lot of funding for COVID testing. Um, that kind of stuff, I assume they'll start off with something very popular. Like the HR1 bill that would make it early, easier to early vote, make it easier to do same day registration. That stuff will be very popular. So I think they have things that they'll push that'll be very popular. Then, like, I think they'll never really move to Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, that stuff we sort of know is unpopular. So the sort of core question to me is this government reform set of issues. Like, my sense is D.C. statehood and adding judges, getting rid of the filibuster, those are kind of like wonky issues where my sense is the average voter does not have particularly strong stance. So my sense is if like Joe Biden, Barack Obama, and Nancy Pelosi become out for D.C. statehood, getting rid of the filibuster, and adding judges, those will become 50-50 issues. My sense is most Democrats will be for them, most Republicans will be against them, because they're issues that will help the Democratic Party and hurt the Republican Party. So from there, so that's my core question, is when an issue is like super divided and super partisan and super divisive, those are the issues where I don't know where I'm, I don't know where Biden's going to go because in the Biden campaign, he's tended to campaign on popular things and not on unpopular things. But on these sort of partisan power issues, it's going to be 50-50 is my suspicion. And then becomes a question of, you know, what is Joe, does Joe Biden want to be a more unpopular, potentially more effective president? And it goes to the question of maybe does he, does he see himself as a one term president or a two term president is a relevant question, too. And I think those are the issues where I don't know where he goes. I think D.C. statehood will poll differently once both parties are really engaged in like Barack Obama has a book tour coming in, I think, a few weeks after the election. I'll be very curious what he says on that in my sense of that he's for adding judges to the Supreme Court. I think that'll become the Democratic mission pretty quickly after that. With oh, man. Voters. Obama's book tour is going to be so interesting. I am like... Because <laughs> he's the people Democrats really care about. He's the exactly. leader of the Democratic Party still. Exactly. Right. He set it up in a way where he kind of has the first word post any potential Democratic victory. Yeah. Or defeat. I mean, or defeat. Or defeat. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yes. <laughs> so, I did a little math, and in terms of what the probability is of Democrats winning uh, different levels of a majority in the Senate, and so when I did this math, which was at the end of last week, for Democrats to win a fifty-two plus Senate seat majority, uh, they have a forty-seven percent chance. Fifty-three plus. It's a 34% chance, and 54 plus, it's a 23% chance. So, you know, about a one in four chance that Democrats are winning 54 plus seats in the Senate, which is not likely, of course. Um, How big, to come back to kind of where we started, how big of a difference does this all make? Of all the things that we've talked about, what kinds of things can they pass with a slim majority versus a 54 plus seat majority. I think 
two things that are really hard um, are any kind of real environmental reform, in part because you have um, a particular rural bias in the Senate. Um, so Democrats that might not object to other types of things might object to big climate change initiatives. You know, if, for example, uh, Greenfield wins in Iowa, right, maybe that's someone who is more reluctant on on climate bills, for instance. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think the Supreme Court expansion is one of the heavier lifts. You know, if, if I had to bet on D.C. slash Puerto Rico statehood versus Supreme Court expansion and only one of those two things happens, I would think that um, statehood would happen first. Um it also depends on how the court behaves, right? There's a post-election ruling on the ACA. The court might figure, okay, we don't want to kind of give Democrats an incentive or shift public sentiment in favor of um, of court reform, right? Um, but I don't know. I mean, look, um, I think Perry's point is important, which is that like kind of all these issues usually wind up polling about the same way anyway, you know, except maybe a big stimulus bill, which probably fairly popular, everything else here, um, you know, kind of always usually winds up being like 40, 50 against the incumbent party. People are a little bit change resistant. Um, so if that's a calculation, then why not do the things that you get the biggest bang for your buck? You know, if you're going to be unpopular anyway, then, you know, why not, um, add justices to the Supreme Court. Now, I mean, with that, you can say, is there like a tit for tat? The Democrats begin, and therefore you're going to create Republicans to add justices um, when they get the trifecta. I mean, probably, yeah, you would think, right? But maybe Democrats think to basically nullify judicial review and everything the trifecta, because now you can always appoint more justices. Maybe they think that's actually better in the long run. I don't know. So I just looked at the Democrats up for re-election in the Senate in 2022. So in swing states, I would say Michael Bennett of Colorado, Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada, and Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire, probably the only three people who can't qualify as being in a swing state of relation in 2022. So those three people are pretty partisan Democrats. I have a hard time imagining if there's some Supreme Court expansion vote, they would, any of those people would vote no against this. So that makes me a little less curious if 52 versus 54 makes a big difference. Um, you know, Manchin and Cinema are probably the most conservative Democrats, but they won in 18, so they're in up till 2024. A court packing vote will be very unpopular in West Virginia, I'm sure, but Manchin does have four years to kind of cover it up if they go there. It's and actually he may never run noting, again as a course, Democrat in West Virginia, too. Precisely, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the this more thing about the House, though, because ultimately the House would have to pass all this stuff, too. And it may be more relevant to think, does the House have 230 votes or 245? Because those sort of 2018 class members, they're nervous about anything, about voting for anything controversial. So ultimately, I wonder if the Abigail Spambergers and the people like that would vote for increasing the judges in the Supreme Court. I think it may be as a big of a House problem as a Senate problem, because if you have 20 Democrats in the House who all won in 2018 and are very nervous about being for anything that seems liberal, that may be a big barrier to sort of really aggressive policy changes as well. Yeah, the 2022 Senate map, um, because Democrats lost all these close Senate races in 2016, which is the echo predecessor year for that, um, is unusually friendly to Democrats. Um, and that's right, that like those three senators from swing states are pretty liberal. I mean, Michael Bennett is not as much, right? But Colorado is not really a swing state at this point, I don't think anyway. Um, so, I mean, that, that helps a bit. But there could also be like the category of like people who are just old and, and or weird, right? Also like people can get, can get sick, right? These are a lot of old senators. Someone can get sick especially in a time of COVID, right? Someone can retire unexpectedly and have to have a special election. And when you have a special election, um, when you're the president's party, usually the other party wins those, right? Um, so there, there are all types of things that can happen that, um, you know, or there's just like kind of a special interest in a certain state against a certain type of bill. Um, so it helps to have a, a margin to spare, I think. Is there a scenario in which 
the Democrats don't have a particularly large majority in the House and there's a progressive caucus that's big enough that can essentially hold up bills that are not seen as sufficiently progressive? Maybe I've just taken the last two years too seriously, but I just don't think the AOC faction has much actual power. Like, I just think they will complain about bills that they're going to vote for. Like, the Freedom Caucus had a lot of power because the Freedom Caucus would, like, hold up bills, funding bills, spending bills, health care bills. I just don't see the AOC caucus of people really being willing to stop bills. Like, Pelosi will be able to say, this bill will give 20 million people health insurance, your bill will give 30. Like, I think, I think that group is just really... I think the squad is very small, kind of organizationally weak. I just don't, maybe I'll be wrong with this, but I don't feel like like the 2017 2018 was kind of defined by Paul Ryan versus the Freedom Caucus. And but the Freedom Caucus also was aligned with Donald Trump in a certain way. AOC and that group will be MSNBC will be against them. The Joe Biden show will be against them. The majority of the members of the House will be against them. I don't see them having much sway. And I'll be curious. Maybe I'll be wrong with this, but I feel like they've had very little actual sway the last two years. Well, maybe that. Yeah, maybe that's why the group is is trying to focus more on primaries, in 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 places where they're pretty sure it's going to grow. Yeah, exactly. So like so. If you're trying to be smart about it, you say, "Okay, we'll play we'll play nice nice with the caucus on the national level and make some protestations that sort of like hold up our ideology, but like let's do some work and win some more seats to to get allies in the Congress." And then, you know, what year did we say she was going to run for president, Nate? 2030 something. 2032. Like, there you go. Then she'll have, you know, she, then she'll have, you know, made nice, nice on the national level, but also built up a following. Like if you if you're thinking about long term strategy, which I'm, I'm, I think they probably are on a certain level. Like th- there is there is that to consider. Also, I just think that there's a mindset among Democrats that like in a couple of years following Trump, when they want to get a lot of stuff done, because you, again, you're you fear the partisan mindset of the country that the the rubber band will will switch back around and hit you two years from now that you might have limited time to act and to enact a, a progressive ish agenda. So you'll want to strike while the iron is hot. hot. Yeah, and and frankly, with um, the fact that all the projections have COVID being really bad. Um, between now and mid January, if not longer, right? But people are saying like these are gonna be like the worst weeks of the pandemic. Um the mood for like bold structural massive change, I think, is gonna be fairly high potentially. You know what I mean? Um and also, you know, we're also probably gonna see, I mean, we we keep forgetting about the fact that like if Biden wins, Trump might not concede. It might be a very tumultuous um turnover process right um and so that notion could i think bolster support for i mean it depends on how you play it right i mean it, maybe if biden goes way far to the other extreme it's like i just have to heal the country and be a caretaker right um but i mean 2008 was kind of similar in that obama won by a, a wide margin amid kind of a national crisis um this i think is a more profound national crisis um, yeah, it's kind of it shows what times we're in when you can call the 2008 financial crisis kind of a national crisis because it definitely felt like one at the time. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, COVID alone, right? Yeah. Um, and then the nation's issues on race and like other things in which, you know, America's image has been affected by the Trump presidency abroad and th- stuff like that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, maybe Biden will say, you know, this is not how I would ordinarily have expected to govern, but like, I am just compelled by the moment to like repair all the damage that's been done for over many years, right? Let's leave it there. And of course, we will have a lot to discuss if this does end up being the case and and we're covering such a situation. Um, But an interesting discussion, nonetheless. So thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Galen. And thanks, Perry. Thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary-Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Also remember to subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.